Hello, and welcome to the third quarter outlook and the latest edition of the Capital Stewards podcast. Inflation is falling, uh, unemployment is rising, and after a strong start to the year, economic data has turned noticeably weaker over the last couple of weeks and months. Is a recession on the horizon? Uh, in our outlook, we're going to talk about inflation, the jobs market, and the economy. And more importantly, uh, we'll dive into what the current economic outlook means for investors in stocks, bonds, real estate, and other asset classes. So if you're wondering if a recession's around the corner, if that's coming, and how to invest now, then this is the episode for you. So let's dive in. First, I always start with long-term returns. We'll talk about what's happened here to date and our outlook for the economy in just a minute, but all of this is short-term in nature. Most of our clients and most inge investors in general have long-term goals. What the chart shows is that the most important fact in investing is choosing the right assets and sticking with it over the long term. You can see over the last 28 years, the S&P 500 is averaging almost 9.8% per year in returns. Gold is just over 6.5%. Bonds just over 4.5%. All of those are outpacing inflation, even after the recent run-up, the spike we've had over the last couple of years, which is running at 2.5%. When we zoom in and look at the past decade, the S&P 500 has returned just under 13% each year on average, so a little higher than, than historically, but, but still good returns, followed by global stocks at 9%. Gold um, and real estate both near 6%. I and mean, commodities like oil and copper have produced negative returns over the last decade. So when you think about the 28-year and the 10-year history, you would be a very happy investor today if you invested at the peak of markets before the global financial crisis or right before COVID. Neither would have felt very good in the short term. It would have felt like you invested money and then it just evaporated. But returns since have been significant. So it's important to keep your long-term goals at the forefront. Don't get lost in the drumbeat of what can and sometimes does go wrong in the short term. So let's talk about what's happened so far this year in markets. So far this year, the S&P 500 is leading the way with returns over 15.5%. Gold has been done surprisingly well with returns over 12%. Commodities are up almost 6%. Inflation is cooling off. The headline number on CPI is 3.3% over the last year, and it was basically zero over the last month. Bonds are essentially flat for the year, and public real estate has had negative returns so far this year. So what's been driving particularly those outsized returns in the equity market and in other asset classes as well? Let's start by looking at the economy, and then we can dive into specific asset classes. Coming into the year, our outlook was titled, The Sugar High is Over. And our basic thesis was that interest rates had been significantly raised over the last couple of years by the Fed, and that would cause the economy to slow down and for inflation to fall. And that's largely been true. After a few years of above average growth, real GDP is back to 2.9% on a year-over-year -year basis and sequentially only 1.3%. So that feels low compared to recent history, but it's very consistent with the growth that we saw over the last decade prior to COVID. So economic growth is not negative, but it is continuing to make progress at slower speeds. The brakes are on, the car is still moving, but we're slowing down. The big reason for that is higher interest rates. Uh, Fed rate hikes from the last couple of years have made it more difficult uh, to borrow and expand businesses and for consumers to keep spending to the same degree. I think one of the things that's a misnomer out there is that inflation is causing consumers to slow down or businesses to slow down. When we look at the data, yes, inflation's up a lot since, since COVID. And you can see in the chart, inflation has risen substantially over the last few years. But average hourly earnings, personal income, the employment cost index, all the things that we use to track the income that, that consumers are making, all of that stuff is up right along with inflation. And so inflation itself is not necessarily the cause of, of the slowdown. It's higher rates, putting pressure on consumers, reducing their ability to spend at the margins, and also keeping businesses from, from borrowing to expand. That's really what's slowing down the economy, not just higher rates, because those you know, the consumers are making enough money to keep spending, even though it hurts us. I know it hurts every time you go somewhere and you spend. We were at dinner as a family a couple of nights ago. I'm like, man, it's $100 to buy dinner now. But that's just the reality. But incomes have gone up to keep up with that. So it's not the higher inflation that's causing things to slow down. It's, it's interest rates. The slowdown, um, while not in the news, has impacted companies and markets. You know, we, we you hear in the news all the time, the S&P 500 keeps going up and up. And at the index level, that's true. When we look at stock returns, most of the S&P 500 returns this year have come from the so-called Magnificent Seven growth stocks. That's NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, Google, among others. In fact, the average large cap U.S. company has seen their stock price increase only 5% this year. And that's actually not terrible historically, but not nowhere, nowhere near the total return of the index. Since the Fed started raising rates in 2022, the average S&P 500 company has increased in value just 
in total over the last two and a half years. So higher interest rates have slowed down the growth for most companies, for the average company in in the economy. It's the top end growth stocks um, that have kept us powering forward over the last couple of years. Housing starts, which is a statistic uh, that tracks new home builds, have fallen since rates increased. That makes logical sense. There's less construction activity buying any number of materials that are necessary to build homes, less trips to Home Depot when you buy a new house and all the stuff you have to get. And lastly, retail sales have stalled out. You see long-term retail sales growing north of 4%, even more for non-store services, so trips and travel and all that kind of stuff. Both metrics are essentially flat year to date, and the, the most recent revisions have gone back to earlier data and revised it down. So retail sales moving in the wrong direction. Let's look at the job market. Uh, how's the slowdown impacting employment? Uh, the jobs market has come back into balance. We've been looking at this chart now for the last few years, assessing the gap between job openings and those that are unemployed or looking for work. There are still more jobs than available workers, but that gap has closed significantly. Uh, we have a small gap between openings and unemployed workers before COVID. That was pushing up wages slightly. That's why we actually had higher earnings in the for hourly workers and sort of for those at the bottom end of the economy the last few years before COVID. We see a similar gap today. There's still more jobs open than there are available workers, but that gap has come down significantly. It's pretty close to where it was before COVID. The demand for workers is still okay. Unemployment still relatively low on a historical basis. You'll see all kinds of news about unemployment rates ticking above 4%. However, unemployment at 4%, 4.1%, 4.2%, still historically low when we were back in COVID or in the great financial crisis and in any other recession we've had. If we had had unemployment at 4%, we wouldn't have thought things were bad. So um, employment may be getting a little bit worse, getting uh, back into balance, but but by historical standards, still really low. For, for us to really have a recession, we need to see unemployment move materially higher. Immigration and additions to the labor force are, are not enough here to move the needle. We did a whole podcast episode on this. There's a bunch of data, so you can go back and, and find that episode and listen to it. We talked a ton about immigration and how that's Im impacting what we see in the labor market, but that's not enough to get you know unemployment up to up to where we need to be to cause a, a recession. So for unemployment to move materially higher, we need to see layoffs and those need to go up materially. I mean, you hear about them in the news, right? So you might think, hey, well, there's more layoffs happening, but you can see that layoffs across the economy, if anything, they're low compared to historical levels, despite what you, what you see. One and a half million layoffs every month is just the normal churn that's happening in the economy as businesses open and close and change direction and, and all those kinds of things. So Rising rates have slowed down growth, but it's impacting the economy outside of the high growth sector. The result of all that slowness and the labor market rebalancing is that uh, inflation has fallen considerably and it will likely continue to come down. Um, you can see the red line is uh, the high Fed funds rate. And when that's above the inflation rate, uh, which the CPI is the green line and PCE um, is the blue line. I'll talk about those more in a minute. Um, when, when inflation's above those numbers, the Fed is enacting restrictive monetary policy, and that puts the brakes on the car, it slows us down. Um, in prior forecasts, we, we talked about shelter extensively, so I won't do a deep dive on that, but shelter, specifically owner's equivalent rent, is a significant part of the inflation metrics. And that makes sense because it's a significant part of most household budgets every month. You pay rent, right? We shouldn't ignore that. But the methodologies that we use to track shelter inflation uh, mean that it's incorporated in the inflation stats with a lag. So if we used more current rent or shelter stats, we'd be at the 2% inflation target today. So continuing to wait on inflation to fall based on lagged shelter statistics might cause the Fed, and in my opinion, to overshoot and create a recession. So that's not what we want. It's important to note the difference, like I mentioned, between core PCE, the personal consumption expenditure deflator, PCE, personal consumption expenditure deflator, and core CPI, which is what you hear in the news a lot, the consumer price index. The core CPI is reported in the news more frequently, but the core PCE is likely a better indicator of underlying inflation. Essentially, the way you can think about the two is you've got a basket of goods that you buy every single month, and the way that the consumer price deflator uh, track some of those goods is a little bit better than the CPI and the the weight that it places on some of those goods is a little bit different as well. So so same baskets of things generally, but, but the ways that we track them a little bit different between the two. The CPI is typically above the PCE. So the CPI index typically above the personal consumption expenditure index by a third to a half of 1%. It's up even more now. So if headline CPI is just below 3%, then the PCE should be pretty close to the Fed's target. So 
don't let that confuse you when you start hearing about the news. Just say, hey, CPI is 3%. I thought the target was 2%. If we've got CPI just below 3%, then we're really close to where the Fed wants to be on inflation. That's really the bottom line. So we're getting close to the target, um, especially when we apply the right kind of analysis to um, the housing stats. On the chart, you can see the Fed's funds rate typically sits right around the core CPI number, perhaps three quarters of a percent above the PCE inflation number. That's neutral. That's what allows the economy to grow on its own. The Fed funds rate sits right in there with inflation. Right now, the Fed funds rate is 2% above the core CPI number, and that's creating a lot of downward pressure on the economy. And I think, like I said, the big risk is that the Fed sort of overshoots its target. Corporate growth is slowing. Consumer spending, retail sales is flattening out. Inflation is very close to being back on target. And when the Fed cuts rates, they typically do that by a quarter of 1% at a time. So they're 2% above neutral now. And that means if they do at a quarter of 1% at a time, they have many cuts to make before they get back to neutral. Even if you believe, like me, that the neutral rate is probably higher than it was over the last decade, even if they do four rate cuts over the next 12 months, they're still going to be apply fairly strong downward pressure to an economy that's already flattening out currently today. And that might push us into recession. So I've been a card carrying member of the Higher for Longer Club for several years, but I do think it's important that the Fed begins to normalize rates just as the economy has normalized. And I expect that they'll cut rates modestly in, in the last quarter of the year, whether that's two cuts, three cuts, something like that. I do think we're going to make some progress on that, um, but we'll see. Um, by the way, some, some folks wonder why the target is 2% and not zero. Why does the Fed want to get rid of all that price inflation we've had over the last over the last few years, wouldn't it be great if we just drove all the prices back down to where they were before COVID? Outright deflation, which is what happened. So there's there's disinflation, which is what we have now, where inflation is the rate of change is going down, but we still have price increases. Deflation is when prices actually drop when they go down. Outright deflation causes its own set of problems. First, if you think prices are going to go down in six months, what are you going to do? You're going to delay purchases. You're not going to go buy those things that you might otherwise buy. And that creates a downward spiral for consumer and business spending. And second, most developed economies have lots of debt. If the assets underlying that debt depreciate, you see people walk away from loans. Lots of other bad things start to happen. We saw just a little bit of that in 2007, 2008, and just a little bit of that created big problems in the economy. So we don't want to repeat any of that. So slow and low inflation, slowing or low price growth, that's the way to go. And that's what we want to see long term. So what does that economic backdrop mean for investors? So first, let's look at stocks. Uh, analysts are, are expecting uh, the S&P 500 earnings to increase about $245 a uh, share this year. So earnings are going to go up to about 245 bucks. That's 11% over last year. I see that's pretty reasonable. However, for the market to keep moving up from where it is now, right? So that's priced in, right? Earnings need to grow 18% over the next 12 months to $260 a share. It seems like a big increase in this environment where things are slowing down, rates are still really high, all the stuff that we just that we just talked about. So here's a few examples. I, I listen to a lot of earnings calls. I always like to talk about sort of what's happening in the real world as opposed to just stats and inflation numbers and charts that, that you see. Walmart is doing really, really well. In the first quarter, they were unsure about their outlook. Now they're clearly the beneficiaries of consumers that are looking for cheaper goods. Uh, Target, meanwhile, is struggling because discretionary spend is dropping. Consumers are trying to stretch their budgets. They're all going to Walmart. So Target's going to cut prices this summer in response to that. So definitely non-inflationary. Caterpillar, the construction equipment company, they still have a healthy backlog. They still, they see sales to be similar to the 2023. So not up much, not down much. So okay, things are moving okay, but not gangbusters. They say construction activity is healthy, but it's not increasing. Uh, Honeywell, another big equipment company, they make uh, engines and all kinds of other industrial products. Sales growth of 4 to 6%, so good, but not great. Uh, drug maker Eli Lilly still expects to see strong growth this year, uh, close to 30% of its business. So there are pockets of the economy that continue to do really, really well. Um, business consultant Accenture is performing well in a challenging macro, but they see companies reducing their discretionary spending, just like consumers. Companies are saying, I don't have to do that this year, so I'm not going to do that new project or buy that company or do that renovation, whatever. Um, JP Morgan highlighted uh, muted demand for business loans um, and no doubt due to, to higher rates there. So I think what you hear in uh, corporate earnings and when executives talk is that the economy is doing okay. That, you know, it's not an emergency situation. We're not in a recession, but, but we're definitely not growing gangbusters. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the sort of underlying business activity to back up what we see in, in the statistics. So were earnings grow this year? I think they will. Are they going to grow 20%? That seems unlikely. 
Um, something more in line with the 10 to 12% historical growth seems more achievable. If the consumer and employment situation hangs in there from here, if it gets worse, then um, we might not even see that. So we could see some backtracking. So you can see from the chart that over time, the market should broadly track earnings. After all, the profit of the company is what you get as a shareholder when you buy the stock. I showed the year-to-date chart earlier, but the S&P index is up over 15% year-to-date. So some of that gain is likely warranted because earnings probably up this year. Um, but the rest is the exuberance around AI and the future prospects of those seven growth stocks that have been driving the market. The price multiple for stocks is 21 times uh, the next 12 months earnings, and that's above average. It's not crazy. It's not as high as the 23 times earnings we saw a couple of years ago. It's not quite uh, tech bubble land yet, um, but it is high. So historical data, though, shows that valuation is a good indicator of future long-term investment returns, but it's not a good tool for short-term market timing. And the reason for that is the market can stay overvalued uh, for really long periods of time. And so trying to look at the, the P-E ratio alone and sort of decide to overweight or underweight stocks is not a good idea. I think staying diversified here makes sense. In order for the market to maintain its current levels, companies have, especially the AI contingent that are, that are driving all that growth, they need to do extraordinarily well in a challenging environment. I think the odds are more likely that they don't quite live up to the really high high, uh, but they continue to grow really fast, but just not quite all the way to the tip top, which is what's currently priced in, than they are that we see you know, another 20% plus year of gains from the S&P 500. So it doesn't mean we're about to fall off a cliff, but if we simply close the year out up 15% where we are now, any investor would take that's a pretty good year. So when we look at global stock markets, so when we move from the US to around the world, the US continues to lead the way. Europe's not in a recession, but growth is pretty anemic. In a lot of ways, similar to the US, the largest growth companies there, ASML, semi-equipment. By the way, we're going to talk a little bit in a minute about, you know, should we invest outside the US or just stay in the S&P 500? I mean, why bother with all these other companies? If you believe in AI, ASML is the only company in the world that makes the products that the chip makers like Taiwan Semiconductor Company and NVIDIA and others have to use to make AI chips. You cannot make AI chips with ASML. They are based in the Netherlands. They're not based in the US. So the largest growth companies in Europe, things like ASML, LMVH, which is in the luxury space, Louis Vuitton, they're doing really well, keeping pace with the S&P. While most of the market, though, is, is kind of falling behind uh, US stocks, Japan, Korea, Australia, going through similarly low growth periods. Select emerging markets, uh, especially India and Brazil, are doing well. Our view continues to be that picking the right high growth companies in international markets is a better strategy than trying to choose sort of countries or benchmarks that are going to outpace U.S. growth. That's one place where we think active management is useful, adds value over time. We think there's, there's data out there to support that. And, and as I mentioned a minute ago, because US S&P 500, particularly stock returns, have been so significant over the past decade, I get lots of good questions about why do we invest anywhere besides in the US, right? If the US is going to be the greatest economy in the world, Brian, and, and I, I do believe that, if you believe that, why would we buy assets in other countries? Why don't we just put it on the S&P 500 and forget it? It's really easy to look at the last decade and conclude that recent history is going to continue to repeat itself. However, investors did not have that perspective or ask those questions in the early 1980s, in the early 1990s, in the 2000s. You can see in the chart, the S&P 500 was the best performing asset class by far in the tech bubble during the 1990s. And then during the period that we've just been through in the, in the 2010s. However, in the 1980s, international stocks far outpaced the U.S. during the rise of Japan's economy. International stocks beat the U.S. three to one. In the 2000s, after the tech bubble collapse and the financial crisis, gold actually outperformed the S&P 500. Emerging market economy stocks also were the best place to be by far. In fact, after strong periods of outperformance, top performers tend to struggle for years. The reason is that markets are not the economy. Um, the internet brought on by the 1990s tech bubble created significant growth. It far exceeded anybody's expectations, even in the 1990s. But that growth was pulled forward into returns during the 90s. And then after the bubble burst, it took many companies a long time to make up some, some of them more than a decade to make a return back to their previous high. So markets discount future activity. So after big price increases, they might need time for the actual growth in the economy to catch up. And while that occurs, other assets outperform. And you see this chart is, you know, you may see similar charts that go year by year and are just used to kind of show diversification. And it's hard to know what things are going to be the best performing asset class every single year. And that's that's a good way to use this kind of quilt metrics too. But but I like to look at it over a longer period of time. And, you know, these are five-year periods. 
where you know you so you've got entire periods of five years or ten years where the S and P five hundred is far from the best performing asset class. So when you're building portfolios that are designed to provide returns over twenty or thirty years, which is probably what your goals are, your investment goals are probably not the next two years or the next five years. It's unlikely that any single asset class, including the S and P five hundred, is going to perform um, best over that entire time period. Um, so a well diversified portfolio, it's not going to reach the highest of highs with the best asset classes during the best times, but it's also not going to reach the lowest of lows with the worst asset classes over the subsequent decades either. You can provide steady above average growth over the long term. Uh, if we switch to bonds, um, like I mentioned, our, our outlook is that we're going to see inflation and rates moving lower. Uh, on the chart, you can see the yields or interest payments uh, coming in from various types of bonds. If you look at the brown line, you'll see it moving up uh, when the Fed rate increases started and then crossing over the pink and the green lines. That brown line represents short-term adjustable rate investment grade, so strong credit companies' debt. Um, that has adjusted up with um, with rising rates. You may hear people talk about the yield curve being inverted, and that is because that brown line, those short-term interest rates are higher than the pink and the green line, which represent intermediate and long-term investment grade debt. Normally, in order to borrow money for a longer period of time, you pay a higher interest rate. But right now, it costs more money to borrow money for a year than it does to borrow money for three years or for 10 years. Given that our view is that rates are going to decline, those short-term rates are going to start to trend down over the next year. And as that happens, investors should be thinking about moving from cash to longer-term bonds. You can see on the next chart, a year-to-date short-term bonds and high-yield bonds have outperformed longer-term investment-grade bonds. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you'll see how quickly that can change. When rates begin to fall, like they did last fall, Longer-term bonds outperform their shorter-term peers significantly. Um, and our view is that continuing to own higher-yield bonds that pay high coupons makes sense. We don't see an imminent recession, um, even though things are slowing down. But investors should be moving from short-term to long-term bonds uh, to take advantage of lower rates. We like doing that by moving from shorter-term to longer term, as opposed to moving from short term to medium term, that short to medium term move costs a lot in terms of current yield. And so we, we think adding to longer term bonds while maintaining exposure to high yield helps you uh, get exposure to some duration if rates start to go down a little bit, some longer term bonds that will outperform. And it also minimizes sort of the give up in, in current yield. In real estate, uh, higher rates and increased vacancies in office space have driven prices down since their peak in 2022, probably not um, a surprise to anyone. Um, you see rates rising and re prices falling in the chart. Uh, office properties, I think, will continue to be troubled for several more years as company leases roll over, as they reduce space. Uh, even with workers back in the office, very few companies need as much space as they did before the pandemic and company leases are five, 10 years. And so there's just going to be this continual drudging of office properties that come off leases. And then companies say, Hey, I need some space, but I don't need five floors anymore. I need three floors or I need four floors or whatever. And that just continually releases new space in, in existing buildings onto the market, keeps prices down. Uh, trophy properties in the office space probably continue to do well, but there's a lot of that so-called class B, class C office real estate that's going to suffer for a few more years, I think. Outside of office, I do think buying new properties or newly created funds is a sound strategy. As real estate starts changing hands at lower valuations that reflect higher interest rates, I think investors would be well positioned over the long term. It's important to be careful, though, because lots of funds that are out there, lots of REITs include both new investments and older properties that they've owned for a long time. And those older properties might still be marked at higher prices. So be really thoughtful about buying funds and properties and make sure that you are buying properties you know, at today's prices, not just buying into properties that were bought before um, at, old, at old prices. Uh, national home prices are up 6% over the past year. Single family residential supply continues to be constrained. We're just not building enough um, for, for the demand. Short-term rentals uh, could also start to become attractive again as rates uh, come down and cash flow, the cash flow from those properties um, looks a little bit better with, with lower rates. So I think single family residential real estate and perhaps some uh, commercial and industrial properties probably are the best opportunities in the real estate, um, in the real estate landscape uh, in our current environment. And then lastly on gold, gold prices are up year to date. I view gold as an important inflation hedge mostly. That's why we mostly use it in portfolios. Um, it's also a diversifier against unexpected scenarios. I don't expect stagflation. I think 
rates are going to continue to go down, but gold's the best hedge. If that were to occur is something different than what we expect happens, happens, which is a good thing to have in your portfolio. Gold also will do well in a recession if the economy rolls over more quickly than we anticipate. So it kind of helps them both, both ways there, both to sort of tail risk scenarios. Foreign central banks are also buying more gold uh, to reduce their dependence on the dollar. This is not the demise of the dollar. The demise of the dollar's primacy globally is way overstated. It's going to be the, re the world's reserve currency for many, many, many more years, if not forever. But there is a slight rebalancing that's occurring, and it doesn't take much rebalancing with big central banks that move billions and billions and billions of dollars to buy just a little bit of gold. That drives gold prices up pretty substantially. So, so bullish a little bit on gold going forward. I think a good asset to own in a portfolio, even if it doesn't do much, that'll mean that lots of other assets and portfolios do extraordinarily well, and that'll be a good thing. What do we do now in light of all this stuff? So I think three things to think about, as I always do in these outlooks. One, rebalance runaway equity positions. You know, we're overweight, U.S. large cap growth. I continue to like um, U.S. large cap growth. It works well historically in, you know, in economies that are decelerating. We've talked a lot about that in episodes before. I think that continues to make sense, but it's also important not to get carried away. So we don't just let it go and go and go and, and get out of bounds. So if earnings come in light for one quarter, those stocks are going to move lower really, really quickly. So it's important to rebalance as you go and benefit from the outside's growth and not let the risk position get get too big. A uh, second, um, I think the risk environment is much more balanced than we've had over the last couple of years. Um, we very well could move into a recession if rates are not reduced meaningfully over the next 12 months. Um, I think the key watch items there are retail sales, uh, business capital investment, and loan default rates. If those positions continue to get worse from here, there's not a whole lot of room left for them to go down. So they could point us into a into a recession. And I think that means investors should be buying long-term high-quality bonds, not just equities in their portfolios in case something in case something goes wrong. I also think it's a good time to consider real estate. If you have the option to buy a single property, whether that's single family or something that's potentially distressed in the commercial world, needs new financing, I think there's opportunities in the real estate market here for the right investor. So those are the three th practical things I think you can do based on how we see how we see things going. So that's it for our outlook going into the second half of 2024. If you have any questions, by all means, reach out for us, reach out to us. We're happy to have a more in-depth conversation about investing, financial planning, taxes, any of those, any of those things. We'd be happy to talk to you more in person. All right. We will talk to you down the road.